This morning, we continue uh, our worship and sermon series from the book of Acts, uh, One Heart and Soul. Some early lessons, from, some lessons from the early church, I should say. Our study continues in uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Uh, that'll be the focus of the sermon this morning. Uh, you can find that scripture in your bulletins, uh, and you can also listen along as we receive this proclamation from God. Listen now for God's word as it comes to you and for you. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wander, wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified His servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. And by faith in His name, His name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given Him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what He had foretold through all the prophets, that His Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of the sermon this morning is, To This We Are Witnesses. In 1558, the island of Frisland was invented by Nicholas Zeno. Zeno was a Venetian from a family of explorers, and he claimed that two of his ancestors discovered the island in the late 14th century. Zeno included a description of the fake island's inhabitants and their way of life in a book that he published to promote the discovery and let everybody know that he found Frisland. Zeno testified in that book that the island's inhabitants were ferocious fighters and that they didn't wear any clothes. And included in that book was an expertly drawn map that portrayed the fake island of Frisland as a rectangular landmass that was just south of Iceland and a little west of Norway. Now, this infamous map of the fake island also included some made-up cities uh, with Italian-sounding names. And the story that Zeno told was that his father and his brother were shipwrecked one day while they were out exploring in the North Atlantic, and when they were shipwrecked, they stumbled upon a prince that happened to speak Latin. Zeno's story goes on to explain that the fake prince of the fake island of Frisland was thoroughly impressed with his new friends from Venice. And the prince welcomed them with open arms because of Venice's reputation throughout the world. You would think that the fantastical story uh, Zeno told and the map that he made would be met with skepticism until all of it was verified. You might also think that somebody would notice that Zeno's account of the Frizzlanders sounded a whole lot like the witness that Christopher Columbus gave decades earlier about his encounters with people in the New World. But instead of being ignored or scrutinized, 
Zeno's entirely fabricated witness to the fake island of Frisland was accepted as fact. Mapmakers inserted Frisland into new editions of world maps. Representatives of the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, claimed the fake island as property of England. They said it's ours. In the 1800s, scholars and historians were still trying to identify Frisland as one of the islands off the coast of Scotland. And so this very real story about a very fake island left me asking two questions that I think are related to our scripture reading. The first question is, why did Zeno promote the discovery of an imaginary island? Why bother? Why write a whole book about a fake place? Well, the answer to that question is simple. It's obvious Zeno published his story to enhance his own reputation and the reputation of his family and also the reputation of Venice. At the time that Zeno invented Frisland, created it, at that time the naval power of Venice was slipping behind Spain and France and England and Venice needed a new discovery to reestablish its position as a superpower on the seas. So Zeno just made one up. Hey, look at us. We invented or we found Frisland. And we know why Zeno invented a fake island. It was propaganda that was put out to prop up the myth of Venice as a world power. And we know that it worked because even the expert witnesses the expert witness of people that the public trusted to tell them the truth was corrupted. But what we don't know is why did everyone believe the secondhand witness of a fake world explorer about a fake island? in the middle of the North Atlantic. Well, based on the sermon that we just heard Peter give, people believed Zeno's story because they wanted to. They wanted to believe in myths that comforted them, that bore witness to the world as it is, not as it should be. It was too much. Too much for them to imagine that smart people would lie for their own self-interest. Too much for them to consider that the world wasn't created by God to be conquered by the powerful. Too much for them to admit their own ignorance. And too much for them to live with the news that Venice was weak. They wanted to believe in Zeno's lie because not believing would invite questions about what they thought was the truth. Now, our reading this morning left out a few details that would be helpful for us to recall. Uh, right before Peter addresses a big crowd, he and John come across a crippled beggar. And they find this crippled beggar on their walk to the temple for prayer. It was an ordinary day. They were going up there for the midday prayer. The two of them are minding their business when a crippled beggar asked them for some money. Now, this crippled beggar was lame from the day that he was born. And each day, people would set him down at one of the temple gates to catch people as they came through for worship. And every day, same place, he was there, his body, lame and laying crumpled on the ground had become a hallmark, a landmark, a way to tell that you were almost there, almost at church. Well, there he goes, we must be close. His figure was ever present and it was see-through at the same time. I don't know if this happens to you, but on my route back and forth from work each day, I, I don't notice much, but I see everything. 
extraordinary feats of engineering like cranes that stand straight up for hundreds of feet beside half-constructed buildings that are just huge, rising up from what was just dirt a few months ago. I see them, but I don't notice. Round the corner from here, as I turn towards the highway, sometimes there is an encampment of neighbors experiencing homelessness, but You know, after a few weeks of passing by, it becomes easier to see without noticing. The crippled beggar is a part of the landscape. And by now, his absence at the gate would gain more attention than his presence. He's been there so long that nobody even notices him anymore. Peter and John would have missed him if he hadn't said something. He asked for their help. He was fully prepared to receive nothing or be ignored or be told a lie. Or if he was lucky, he'd get just enough to eat. And maybe his donor would be proud for following through on the instruction in the Jewish law that alms be given to the poor. But our crippled beggar has a problem. Peter is broke. John has no money either. And they tell the crippled beggar this just out loud. What do we have to give you? Nothing. Look at us, they say. The crippled beggar just keeps staring at them. He won't let them go on to church. He demands to be noticed. He expects them to give him something. Peter sees something in his look that makes him stop and notice. Now, all the gospel writers note that Peter's always in a hurry, always in a rush to solve a problem as he saw it. But on this day, Peter stops and he notices that the problem wasn't the crippled beggar's lack of money. It was the brokenness of his body. His body. Oh, his body ever present and see-through at the same time. His body crippled by a mysterious coincidence of the cosmos, a break in time and space. His body evidence that there are some problems that, you know, we just have to live with. His body, a little bump on the road, over there on the side, on the way to temple. And it was his body And the story that had been written about people with bodies like his that Peter could no longer bear to witness or walk by. And so Peter healed him in an instant. And in the name of Jesus, he told him to get up and walk. And that's where Peter's sermon and our scripture begins. The three of them, Peter, John, and the no longer crippled beggar, are all walking into the temple together. And as you would expect, the no longer crippled beggar is emotional and he isn't keeping his newfound ability to walk a secret. He's prancing around everywhere, jumping up and down. His arms are in the air. He's praising God. He's shouting. He's making all kinds of noise. He's emotional and he isn't keeping his newfound ability to walk quiet. Everybody at the temple already knows who he is, but they've never seen him stand up before, much less jump with his arms up in the air. And you would think now, you would think that uh, people gathered for midday prayer would join him for a big collective jump around everybody. Get up. You would think that there would be a spontaneous outburst of collective exuberance you would think they'd start planning him a walkabout party after church, posting videos on their social media, you know, with the one with the balloon and the streamer. They put all that in the caption, the emoji in the caption, right? Party time. But none of this happened because everybody just stopped and they all just stared at Peter and John as if they brought their pet skunk to a birthday party. They stared at them like they'd done something wrong, like bring bring a kid to church that couldn't sit still and worship. 
Or better yet, like they'd invited the kid to come on up, play the organ for us for this final hymn. Instead of shouts of hallelujah and glory, glory, you heard the crowd suck in a bunch of air. (gasps) And hold their breath and you saw them cover their mouths and you saw them whispering to each other. They're all muttering under their breath. Was it he one of Jesus' boys? Didn't we take care of that problem? And Peter's response to all their heavy breathing and hand-wringing was to tell them the truth they did not want to hear. This morning we hear Peter say, that there is no Frisland. It was all a lie. Jesus healed on the Sabbath and the religious leader said, the Sabbath is more valuable than life itself. Not true. There is no Frisland. And Jesus cast out demons and the expert witnesses said he was dangerous. Not true. There is no Frisland. Jesus forgave sinners and the expert witnesses said he didn't have the authority to relieve people of their guilt. Not true. There is no Frisland. And Jesus made friends with ethnic minorities and the expert witnesses said he was defiling the purity of the dominant class. Not true. The first will be last. There is no Frisland. And Jesus said, do not be afraid or worry. And you know what the expert witnesses said? They said we should be afraid of dying like Jesus if we challenge the status quo. Not true. Because living in fear is like dying. There is no frizzling. And Jesus said, like the morning sun, he will rise. And Jesus said, like the crippled beggar that just got up, he wouldn't lay down on Easter. But the expert witnesses said, they decide who lives and dies. Not true. There is no Frisland. Well, today our witness is being requested. As followers of Jesus, what do we testify to have seen and heard? What do we hold to be true? What do we hold to be worthy of our prayers and our dreams and our attention and our suffering and our sacrifice? and our place in line, and our weary feet, and our tired hands. We live in a world that wants to know by whose authority do we claim there is a reason to hope. To this, we are witnesses. The griefs, the sighs, the groans of creation can be heard right outside the doors of this sanctuary and in it as well. You cannot get to church without passing by. The cries and protests of people crippled by grief that comes after violence can be heard. To this, we are witnesses. And the expert witnesses would have us believe that there is nothing we can do. But we are resurrected people. And to this as well, we are witnesses. Well, to this, we are witnesses. The crippled beggars getting up off the ground. To people who were once quarantined in their homes, being out and about once again, noticing and seeing each other noticing each other's stories and 
appreciating the presence of bodies close by. To this we're witnesses. There is a reason for hope. To this we're witnesses that that some people don't have bootlegs to pull up on. Some people do need a hand up. To this we're witnesses. To this we're witnesses that all of us at one time or another could have been found begging or crippled. Alone, stuck, hopeful, or just a little bit of change, maybe even having given up on the possibility that we might walk again. To this, we're witnesses. May we have the courage and the grace and the compassion to tell that truth when someone asks what's left for us to hope for. In the name of God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.